Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the podcast. My name is Courtney. I am here with my spouse, Royce, and today we actually have a very special guest. We are very excited to have a conversation with her today. Those of you who have been following us for a while, or those of you who found us recently but decided to go all the way back to the first episode and just binge us all the way through in order, we see you too. Uh, Some of you may be aware that back, I think it was last November, we played the game One Night Stand. I don't know when that episode actually came out, but we, we talked about One Night Stand, the game, a little bit about the creator and just the concept of One Night Stands as we understand it. And so we're we're absolutely thrilled. We actually have the game developer with us today. So this is going to be an excellent conversation, I'm sure. Please introduce yourself to our audience. Yeah, thank you, Courtney. It's nice to be here. Yeah, so I'm Lucy Blundell, but you may see me online as Kimoku. I'm an independent game developer, and I made One Night Stand. And I'm currently working on my next game, which is called Videoverse. And previously, kind of before that, I worked at EA Chilingo, which was like the kind of mobile games kind of acquisition. And they published the original Angry Birds and Cut the Rope. And I was like a graphic designer there. And then I've done like some jury work for the Independent Games Festival and also occasionally freelance on like other indie projects. Um, I identify as a grey asexual, although I kind of pass as straight. I am married to a man. <laughs> and yeah, I also flip flop between like uh, de- describing myself as agender or gender neutral. I'm also happy with being called a woman, but I'm, ve- I'm very much like still trying to, I'm still trying to find myself, but I like the kind of non binary umbrella. And yeah, I go by she, her, and they, them. Excellent. Very good to know. Thank you for that. Uh, where where to begin? There's so much we want to talk about. There's so much we want to talk about. I, I guess since our listeners are already a little bit familiar with the game One Night Stand since we talked about that, let's sort of start there because I think people who don't really understand the nuances of asexuality or what the gray area within that could possibly entail mm-hmm might be quick to say, like, why would an asexual creator make a game about a one night stand? So I'm just curious about what your inspiration for that was and what that process was like for you in in your own identity. Mm. Yeah, so it's an excellent question, because I think a few people are very confused uh, when they hear that, you know, someone on the asexual spectrum made a game about sex. but I think, like, I think a lot of asexuals end up talking maybe more about sex than, like, allos do. I think maybe we, we, th- we don't think about it in the same way, but we do think about it an awful lot. And I think for me, like, I was kind of a little bit fed up of not seeing the conversation around sex, the awkwardness around sex, like, seeing two people, like, their kind of personal connections with each other, like, that's, what I'm like way more interested in. So yeah, like I think it's this this kind of for me, like as a grey, I've always been kind of questioning it, like, oh, I'm kind of this, but I'm also kind of that. And this feeling of being in between and not quite understanding that, I think that's where making this game, you know, was helping me understand where I lie. And I think, like, having played it and then knowing, like, oh, the person who made this is grey asexual kind of makes sense. It's like, well, there's not actually any sex in the game. (laughs) And to some people's disappointment, like, where's the sex? You know, I've had that comment a lot. And yeah, I think that's that's it, really. Like, I I mean, the original inspiration was, like, I, I think when some people ask the story, they expect me to say, like, oh, it's based on personal experience, and it totally isn't. It's very much a what if, you know, you know, I I think I suffer a lot from like FOMO and wondering like, what's the other side of like the coin? Like, what's that life like? So I just wanted to make this, this story after seeing like a guy one morning who looked like maybe he'd had a one night stand. 
and then this idea just running away with me a little bit. Mm. That actually does make a lot of sense to me when you say that we don't necessarily on the asexual spectrum think or talk about sex in exactly the same way an allosexual person does, but there is a lot of consideration there. And I think we we often come at it from a place of curiosity, of wanting to understand, but also wanting to know where we fit in this sphere and sort of what our personal relationship is to uh, things, sex, mm-hmm. relationships, connection, and and everything that that may or may not go along with it. That That actually does sound a bit reminiscent when we were playing your game. And when we were talking about your game, that was actually something that Royce, you brought up uh, in your late teens, early twenties, you were also kind of exploring your own sexuality. And a lot of that was just more of a curiosity and an experimentation process rather than, I guess, desire or... or... Yeah, my own identity sounds pretty similar to how you described yourself, Lucy. I consider myself agender now. I've never really had a connection to gender, but I, I also don't really care about pronouns used. I, I understand that I, I pass male and I don't have any aversion to that. If I think critically about gender, I tend to just toss it all out. Mm. Gray asexuality was also one of the terms that I held for a brief period of time because I first heard the term asexual and my impression of it was a more extreme like sex repulsed thing at that time. And I was like, well, I'm, I'm not that. But there's clearly a big gap between what I thought was the definition of asexual at that time and what I knew as allosexual. Mm. I was like, I'm somewhere in the middle there. So Mm. it did take a bit of exploration to kind of find the terms that fit. And Courtney, one thing we've talked about within the ace community, well, within really any queer community, I think that anytime you realize that you are not what society expects you to be, anytime you're off of the like heteronormative curve, you have to kind of stop and, and think about Wait yourself and how you interact with everyone a bit more. And I, I think that's why we've seen a lot of cases of aces and arrows playing things like dating sims or reading literature that involves romance, even if it mm-hmm. isn't something that they themselves desire in their own life. There is that curiosity a lot of times. Yeah, definitely. I mean, for me, like when it comes to like asexuality, is is gray but when it comes to romance i'm very romantic <laughs> and i don't know if that really comes across in the game i don't so basically the main kind of character that you see in the game the the strange the strange woman she is demisexual but that's never like stated in fact this is kind of the first time i'm saying this and she is very, very romantic and she, you know, she's got like her diary at the side and she writes in some of her thoughts and she seems like that the more you explore around the room is like, oh, this is, uh, this one night stand isn't, doesn't seem like something that she'd have done. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she did it in like some kind of drunken rejection upset. And also from my own experience of, well, I want, you know, she's she's quite young. She's um, like in university and she's like, well, I want to see what the fuss is all about. Mm-hmm. Uh, but she really does like regret having done it. So yeah, like for me, like the romantic side, I've always been like very attached to people. And it's kind of, that's always been in conflict with my own personality as well, because I don't know, like, I'm quite socially awkward. <laughs> um, I think that awkwardness also comes across in the game. And I also am asexual, so it's kind of like, well, it, it almost, like, clashes with some of my other personalities a little bit. Yeah, I don't really know where I'm going with this. but <laughs> Well, it's it's very interesting to hear you say that because, you know, it, I mean, sort of like where I said, like so many aces like playing things like dating simulators. And I mean, we very much fall into that camp. <laughs> I think just in, in general, storytelling and fiction is a very, very good way to 
explore different sides of yourself, whether you are the one writing and creating it, or if you're just engaging with it. Mm. And that's something that I really like in particular about video games. Cause of course I'm, I'm a big reader. I'm always reading. I'll occasionally find a TV show or a movie that I'm in love with, but not as often as books or video games. And to me, uh, the power in playing a video game, especially one like this, where you have choices that actually affect the world around you and the characters around you. It really, to me at least, I don't know if this is for everyone, but to me, it gives you more of an emotional impact because then if you make a bad mm. choice, you 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 feel the guilt like, oh, I, I made that choice. No one made me do that. And now I must live with my consequences. Mm-hmm. And, and so that's something that I think is so interesting when you put it in a game like this, because there very much was like, I, I haven't ever been in this situation myself personally, but I could kind of feel that awkwardness, that tension. I, I could kind of feel the woman in the game, like wanting to play host, like, can, can I get mm-hmm. you a coffee and like <laughs> in my house? I want to be a nice host, but she also very clearly had her boundaries. Yeah. And you could feel and sense those boundaries. And if you crossed them, you became aware that you crossed a boundary. And I found that to be really, really refreshing because it was realistic and we weren't gamifying. It's not like having the one night stand or getting a girlfriend or getting a second date was like the point. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the goal. It was really more about this kind of awkward interaction between two uh, strangers, essentially. Yeah. And so I, I found that to be very, very interesting. And I think that's something that is very, very appealing to uh, people in the Ace and Arrow communities, because it's like you get to experience something that you don't even really want to do in real life, but you don't really have the consequences of having done it. Right. Yes. And you you can still sort of have that emotional experience with mm. it if if l- like like you did, if it was very well written. We I I can't stress this enough. We really, <laughs> really enjoyed the game. We are a big fan of it. Thank you. But when when there is just this really good writing and you you have the autonomy to make these choices, you can still have that emotional connection and it gives you a place to explore it on that level without actually crossing your own boundaries as a person. Because I I don't necessarily want to go out and have a one-night stand, but (laughs) I am so endlessly fascinated with what brings a person to this point and then what does happen the next day when this isn't necessarily something you want to keep doing. Yeah. So it's it's really that human connection aspect of it that I find so personally fascinating that I enjoy exploring. Yeah, it's um, the thing is like I you, you mentioned um, it's very one night stands very realistic and that's kind of something that so I I've made a few of the games that I've never released but every one of my games has that kind of realism to it um, I don't really like you know offering like a character on a plate to the player like oh here's your reward. And and the weird thing is, like, I play loads of games like that. I love games like that. I really like Atome games. It's like, yes, I want that cute guy. He's mine. I'm going to go after him. I, I love that stuff. But I also think it's very important to have the other, um, to show that, yes, that's it. That's a gamey game. But we need to also show players that sometimes life doesn't really go the way you want it to. Like, there's only so many kind of power fantasies and wish fulfillments that games should give players. Um, you, you, I just worry, I think a lot of what I worry about sometimes is like entitlement, um, mm-hmm. especially like entitled gamers. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it, it just needed to kind of, there needed to be something to counteract all the other kind of romance sims. I, that's yeah. how I felt about it when I, I came up with the idea. And that absolutely translates. That was something that we were just so excited to to see represented in that way. Because there, there definitely can be, especially when we step out of our, you know, asexual community or even the more broadly queer community. 
there, there definitely is a lot of entitlement in games, especially when you think to like the, the stereotypical, like cis het bro gamer dudes of, <laughs> of yesteryear, which we, we know the gaming community is so much more uh, lush and diverse than that. But that, that is always a concern of mine when I step into a game that does have a sexual or romantic element and and I think your your game avoids everything that sets off those anxiety alarm bells uh, very very well. And you know th- this is not a video game necessarily, but it is gaming. Rice and I we play uh, quite a bit of D and D lately, <laughs> and they they just recently made an announcement for this new one D and D. It's it's the next iteration after the fifth edition. And they they made a new rule, which I don't love. I don't think we're ever going to play it exactly this way. But they're saying, you know what? This has been a house rule for ages. If you roll a 20, a natural 20 on the dice, whatever you're trying to do passes no matter what. And I mean, usually we agree. If you're shooting a bow and arrow, if you're swinging a sword and you roll a 20, like absolutely it hits fine. Hmm. But I have just played too many campaigns where someone's like, the horny bard character and they're like, I'm going to try to seduce the barmaid or I'm going to try to seduce the monster that we're playing against. And it's like, no, if this, if this NPC or this character already had a boundary and you are trying to seduce them and they're not into it, I don't care if you roll a natural 20, it's not happening. Yeah, <laughs> so. it's, it's kind of like, does that character get to roll as well? <laughs> are they, you right, know, right. And, that, and that's that's how, like, you know, I was thinking of, of when I, I wrote The Stranger, like, oh, well, what about what she wants? I don't care if she's fictional. She's the person you're interacting with right now. Yes, yes. And, and, and that, that's what I just really loved about it. It's like she had her boundaries and the game was respectful of her boundaries. So it, that's what I think made it feel really human was because she felt really human. Mm. So I'd love to hear a little more about in as much or as little detail as you're comfortable going into, what exactly is your personal definition of this sort of gray asexuality, the gray area? Because I... I think you can talk to 10 different gray aces and when they talk from personal experience and not textbook definition, you'll hear 10 different answers. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah, like I've heard, uh, you know, other like kind of gray ace stories and it's like, oh, I've never slept with anyone and I don't want to, uh, but I still feel that. And for me, it's like, well, that's not my story at all. Like Mm -hmm. I had several boyfriends when I was younger. The interesting thing about me is that I, my kind of grey story is, it took me so long to find it. I only found out about the term asexual in my 30s. Um, I'm 35 right now, so it's quite recent. (laughs) But when I look back to my life, all the signs were there. Mm -hmm. Like, there were, you know, kids at school like even you know young kids but also like young teenagers like getting interested in the opposite sex and I just wasn't I did start like developing crushes but it was very romantic it was like I want to hang out with you and we cuddle and that's kind of it and maybe we play games and we're each of us like you know significant but that was kind of that was kind of it and I didn't you know, I I had quite not that not that I was popular at school, but I had a few boys like ask me out when I was younger, and I was like, no, I'm not interested. Then rumors started spreading, like, oh, she's Lucy's a lesbian, she's frigid, she's all these things, and then you you learn, like, am I am I gay? Am I queer? Like, what's what is this? It's like, well, I I mostly like boys, so I think I'm normal, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know. And then, like, I had, like, you know, boyfriend when I, I think my first one was when I was, like, 15 or 16. And I kind of just went along with, it's like, well, I guess this is what I should be doing, but I really wasn't that interested. And then, you know, that, that didn't work. And then I had another boyfriend afterwards, and he asked me, like, you know, he, he wanted to find out what my deal was. And mm. he's like, he's like, what do you find attractive about men? He's like, you don't seem into me. And I'm like, 
And he was like, what body part is it that you like? And I'm like, oh, I, no. don't, I don't know. <laughs> Tell me specifically. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And I, I just couldn't answer him. I think he was like expecting me to say like, oh, I, you know, genitals of some kind. Um, he's like, oh, well, I like this on women. And I'm like, I don't really, I, I like personalities. <laughs> <laughs> So that was like the, a big major hint that something was a bit different. Um, mm-hmm. But I was still like very romantically interested in boys. So I was still like, you know, trying to like figure out what is going on. So without going into like my whole life story, I eventually found like a boyfriend that I felt more comfortable with, a bit more attracted to. And that's the thing. That's where like the gray comes in. It's like, okay, so it is there. It's just very kind of weak and very irregular. It's just it's just not a very common thing for me. I feel way more connected to kind of asexual people than allosexual people, but I also can't eradicate, you know, the other side of it because it is also there. So, yeah, I think that's that's the main thing and then, you know, going around like in my like late teens, early 20s still not really figuring out what was going on. And then, of course, Bojack Horseman comes along, mm. and I'm like, oh my god, like, that episode, well, several episodes where Todd is, um, as you guys have done some great episodes on Todd before. We talked so long that <laughs> we <laughs> yeah. that we made that our first two-part episode, and it still ended up being one of our longest episodes. It's so good. We can't <laughs> say enough good about Bojack Horseman. Yeah. And it was that moment where he's kind of sat next to, I can't remember his, like, girlfriend's name. Is it Emily? Emily, the high school girlfriend. Emily, yes. yes. And she's, like, kind of sat next to him, and he's just, like, animated, and he has this facial expression, and he is so awkward. He's like, what is this? Why are you sat next to me on this bed? Like, I want to leave. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh my god, I... I relate with that. And that was the first time I'd really seen that. And it's crazy that that's the first time, you know, like the first time that you know that it's normal and it's okay, you know? Mm -hmm. So I was like, I I saw myself in it, but I was also like, but I'm not fully that, you know? So how it goes, you do an online quiz and it's like, oh, it says I'm gray asexual. And you're like, "Hmm, does that feel right? And it's like, yeah, I think, I think it does. So that's that's it really and i i have to admit like i'm still i'm still figuring myself out i'm still like not wanting to put myself in a box i i like gray it feels not too pressurizing i can just be a bit more free but i understand now like way more about who i am and why i was the way i was when i was younger it is absolutely an ongoing process. I mean, mm. no nobody is ever going to be pigeonholed in one label for the rest of their life indefinitely with no nuance. And so it, it's whatever serves you and feels good right now. And I think that's really one of the s- most important aspects of having diverse representation because hearing your story makes sense. There there are echoes of my own experience, echoes of other asexual spectrum people that I've spoken to where there was something where you knew something wasn't quite exactly like everyone else before you ever had the word for it and before Mm -hmm. you even really knew where to start exploring. And I, I mean, I obviously just love BoJack Horseman, but going going back to your earlier life when people were saying like, oh, is Lucy a lesbian or, or is Lucy frigid? It's I think that happens to a lot of us. I yeah. was also, I, I think I was technically bullied for being a lesbian, but at the time I was like, that's not an insult. So fine. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, which is just absolutely bonkers to me that there are still some people who think that, you know, asexuality isn't really queer. Some people will be like, oh, asexuality can be queer, but only if you're homo romantic and you straight Mm -hmm. aces don't count. We hear that all the time. It is very hateful, but it also just really washes over a lot of what our experiences actually are. Because before you had the word, before you had the exploration of the spectrum other people were sensing that there was something about yeah. you that wasn't like them. And yeah. even without the language, that is something that other people sense. And that 
that is a queer experience. Very much. Yeah. Because like when I think back to, you know, school and the kids that later turned out to be like gay, it was the exact same thing. It was like, we never really knew what it was. We were, we were kids and we didn't quite have the words for it because mm-hmm. we were young, but we knew that you could kind of sense that something was different about that person. And, you know, then sadly, sometimes they got bullied for it. And it's the same thing. Like, I I was bullied for... And I don't think it's just my asexuality, but it was because I was a bit weird and a bit different and not Mm -hmm. into the things that everyone else was. Like, oh, why does she not want to, you know, have a boyfriend? And, you know, it was either, like, lesbian or frigid, or sometimes it was just like, oh, she thinks she's above everyone else. Mm. I got that a lot. Mm. And it's like, no, I just want to, like, stay in the library and read books and draw. (laughs) I just want to, yeah, I don't know, that's just how I've always been. And... I think yeah like it can it can be perceived in in a bad way when you're in you know that kind of school peer pressure environment. Mhm. Ab- absolutely. I think I think a lot of people can relate to that. So yeah I mean going way back you there you just said like oh I I just wanted to sit and draw and and read <laughs> books. So artwork I take it has always been a very important uh side of your personality, your life? Yeah, definitely. I think my mother was um, an artist, um, kind of like part-time, just doing it as a hobby, but she was really good. And now she does it as like a full-time job, which is really cool. But yeah, like it's kind of always been in the family. And, and I remember painting when I was like three or four years old in like nursery. And like, yeah, that's I was like, yeah, this is what I'm going to do with my life. I'm going to paint pictures. <laughs> and then when I got a bit older, it was when I was about 12 or 13, I was drawing like comics at my like desk over the summer holidays. And I was like, this is what I want to do. I want to illustrate stories and make, make money from it. And I did try and kind of dip into comics quite a few times, but it never really took off. And I think like, looking back I think my artwork was never good enough but I was also really into like computer games and technology I was always messing around with like web design and things like that Um, and it came a lot later when I realized like oh I can program as well that was a very interesting more of a story about gender stereotypes Mm. that I grew up thinking only only boys program and it's interesting because my brother is a programmer and I always thought like, oh, I'll just, I'll just leave it to guys. Like I can't figure that out. And it's really weird that I thought that because I never really thought myself as stupid or slow or anything like that. I just thought like girls don't do that because I've not seen girls or women do that. Mm-hmm. So in my late twenties, I'm like starting to try it out myself. Like I, I use RemPy, which is a visual novel engine, and it's actually quite simple. And I like I said I'd done like web design and other things before I was like oh this isn't that different so I just taught myself like how to do it and a big reason that I make visual novels is because I still have that desire to tell a story with my illustrations but also it's quite easy to code (laughs) Mm. so it just seemed like a really good fit and it mixed the kind of art with the technology and that turns out that's that's where I like to be I think that is outstanding. I I mean, I, I am an artist. I have throughout my life transcended many different mediums, but I've never gotten into the tech side of things, but I've always enjoyed playing video games since I was young. So I'm very much a video gamer, but <laughs> it, it's so fascinating to, to hear you say that you just didn't think girls did that because there, there are a lot of technology fields like that, even some science fields. I mean, there's a big push for like women in STEM. And in, in fact, ev- everything you're talking about too, there, there's like an ACEs, there's an ACEs in comics group, mm-hmm. there's an ACEs in STEM group. And those are all fantastic because I love seeing communities come together because it can feel very lonely and isolating if you're the only person with your identity in, in a group of mm-hmm. people. And I mean, I guess Royce, you, you have a lot more experience with, uh, the technology side of things than I am because I am 
I'm not a tech person, but you, you went to school for this. <laughs> were there, were there many, um, women in your class? There were some, uh, the demographics were definitely skewed, but it, it wasn't rare. I, I think that there were more women in art and animation majors mm-hmm. than in programming majors, but, but there were still a number. The school I went to was pretty small. It was a school that was devoted towards game development. Where those were the, the three biggest majors were video game programming, which is what I majored in, game design, and game art and animation, which had a little bit of overlap with non-gaming art and animation, which could be either more towards like the creation of movies or um, just other forms of digital art. Just the, the major representation on campus was game art and animation. I didn't go into the video game industry myself, but I, I did kind of learn in college that I liked the programming aspect of it, first and foremost. I found that when I did try to actually make something, I never really had a story that I wanted to tell enough to actually go through the effort to make something. Mm-hmm. And I was also kind of frustrated that when I would have an idea in my head, I could do all the work to make it work programmatically. But at the end of the day, it probably wouldn't look the way I envisioned it unless I had someone else to collaborate with. And so I ended up kind of playing around with a few things here and there, finding myself getting lost in the technical details and then deciding I don't actually need to work in the video games industry. I'm just going to do general software and play games. (laughs) That sounds fine. It probably pays more, to be honest. (laughs) It's interesting, though, that you say that the kind of art and animation courses had like kind of, you know, an even split of women and men because I actually studied animation at university and I was like the only other woman. There was like one other woman and that was it. And the rest of the class was men. And I really was not expecting it. I was expecting it if I'd gone into, you know, computer science or something like that. But I was really shocked because I thought like, you know, Disney is a huge inspiration for a lot of people going into animation. And I always think, oh, the Disney fans tend to be more female. So I was really surprised. But I think it was just a a weird year because the year after it was an even split. It was like 50% girls, Mm. 50% boys. So I don't know what happened there. But all I know is that it was kind of, it was a little bit sad for me that I didn't really have like other, um, female students to kind of work with or collaborate with and yeah it kind of meant that I did a lot of things on my own which then led to like me becoming a kind of solo independent game developer I just ended up learning like how to do it all myself maybe not very well but I'm able to do a little bit of everything so that happens to some degree I think in any sort of small company or Mm. particularly indie game developers whether it's one person or a small group of people, you end up having to take a lot of various individual responsibilities wherever you can just to to make things work. Yeah. Yeah, it was like that when I worked at EA Chilingo, because that was like a very small branch. And when I first started, it was like, oh, could you do like this user interface? Like, we need it reskinning. And then it was, oh, could you do a magazine advert? And then, oh, we want a 3D model so we can make like a toy like in a you know, for <laughs> for merchandise. And it was just like, wait, what the heck is this job? Like, I'm doing all kinds of things. So, yeah, I've, I've always just been kind of good at do, kind of jack of all trades, master of none, I think. That That's kind of funny, though, because anyone who's ever worked in a remotely tech field has been called in to, you know, fix someone's computer or do something that isn't really in their, their job <laughs> yeah. description. Just because it's like, oh, you you do computer things, and and in your case, it was well, you do art stuff. So <laughs> we need we need some kind of art over here. the The medium doesn't matter. It's just you are the art person. Yeah, we need more art. <laughs> That's so interesting. Uh, one thing I'm I'm just curious to touch on because both of you are in the non-binary umbrella, one way or another. And talking about fields and and school and just sort of things that tend to skew one gender or the other in the binary sense, did did either of you have any sort of like introduction to actually non-binary identities at that time? Because I, I feel like right now, 
everybody, at least at least in the media with the cultures, it's like, oh, well, colleges, nobody has any gender anymore. And it's it's all gender anarchy and everybody's queer. And I feel like that's a, a, a big exaggeration. <laughs> the queer community is still very much the minority. But yeah, was was that any factor in for either of you? I mean, I can't really say for me it was. No, I feel like it's again like kind of similar to the asexual term, like non-binary and stuff. At least where I went to university and everything, just it's almost like it didn't exist, even though it did. We just didn't mm-hmm. have the words. Yeah, that that makes sense. There were at least a few people who were openly trans or who started transitioning at my college. Some of whom I knew pre-transition, and so I, it was something that I was aware of. But I don't think it really played a prominent role in my own identity. I mean, labels are, I mean, we're, we're always finding new labels and some of them fit, some of them don't. But actually, actually this, this is kind of related to gaming. <laughs> I think we're allowed to talk about this since they didn't technically end up using us for anything. But Xbox just recently did their, their big like Pride Month campaign with their mm. little Pride controllers and things. Yeah. They they were talking to the two of us. We we oh, were going cool. to interview with them for something, but I think the whole project kind of ended up being less of a thing than they originally intended it to be. But they kind of sent us like a wall of um, pride flags, and they were like, "Which of these apply to you?" <laughs> and <laughs> and a lot of them were were like having to look up because it's like I've never seen that flag before. What what is what is that flag? <laughs> and uh, one of them was try gender and i was like try gender why that's not a word that i have heard spoken aloud no. or read before but then i started thinking back i i was like 5 or 6 years old and and as a little child i was drawing a little pie chart and i was like 50% boy 50% girl and then i was like nope that's not right and then i was like 25% girl 25% boy 50% other <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yep, that that sounds good. And then in the other, I was like, that must be Courtney. <laughs> and I, I like wrote Courtney under other. Aww. So and 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 I like kept that pie chart in in my like toy box. And and <laughs> it's it's just so fascinating because I I suppose in the spectrum that is non-binary, I would also fit there in some way. And to to just Literally, as a, a matter of just a couple of months ago, to hear the word tri gender, like there are three genders. I was like, I made that pie chart when I was five. <laughs> and I don't think it's a useful enough label for me that I'm going to start being like, everyone, I am tri gender, mostly because I'm also very femme and I am very much a woman, like in the same way a drag queen is a woman. <laughs> Some people get mad when I say that because they're like, you are not drag. I kind of am a drag queen. (laughs) I used to perform at drag bars. And I know that there's more to being a woman than dressing up and presenting feminine. But that that is my expression of being a woman. And I love being high femme. And I mean, I will dress up in like a full Victorian ball gown to go to the mall just because that's the only way I can palette going to the mall if I have to. <laughs> so like, yeah, I I like she, her. I like I like the performance of being a woman. So I'm like, oh, well, we'll go with that. There, there's more nuance there, but we'll go with that. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> so... I'm so glad that we are talking to you now. We've we've been wanting to sit down and have this proper conversation for months now, but we were just so blown away by how much of a surprise it was to to find out that you are part of the ACE community because we, we mentioned this a bit in our previous episode. We already had your game and we were planning on playing it after ACE week last year, because we were like, oh, we're so busy. We've got a lot of things we need to do for ACE week. But after ACE week is over, let's play this game. And this will be our game that we sit down and relax to after all of this. And then lo and behold, on (laughs) on Disabled ACE Day, I started following all these people who are using the Disabled ACE Day hashtag. And I found your account. And I was like, Royce, you'll never believe this. The game we are about (laughs) to play. 
So that, that was just so, so fortuitous. So Mm. what, what can you tell us about being a, a disabled gray ace and finding that hashtag and finding us in the community or anything like that? So I guess it's very nice uh, it's heartwarming for me to hear you say I'm part of the community because I don't feel like I am. That's not because I feel excluded, although it could be because I'm older, maybe. But I think it's also because I, I don't know, I tend to keep to myself. I only went to like my first Pride this year. And I even then I only kind of dipped in. I was like, d- you know, just testing the waters like, oh, what's this about? You know, mm-hmm. and I saw the like, asexual flags and I was just like I felt so happy I felt so good so I was like okay next year I'm gonna make a whole day of it and I'm gonna I'm gonna have a really good time ah but yeah uh I think I found I think I found you guys on Twitter originally I don't know how but I I heard that you did the podcast and I thought oh wow that I wanted I want to learn more because this is still new to me so so yeah, thank you for uh, doing the podcast because it's my main source of asexual information. <laughs> and um, well, hopefully we're doing it justice. <laughs> yes, I think so. It's uh, it's something I look forward to every week. So yes, thank you. So yeah, so I found you guys on Twitter, and then I started listening to your podcast, and then obviously like because of that, I was like following you on Twitter, and I think I'd saw, seen you guys tweet about it and retweet other people. And I was wondering, like, oh, should I, should I tweet? Because the label asexual still feels kind of like I'm. I don't feel like I'm fully out yet. I am online and with a few people in real life, but that's kind of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of the way I want it to be, I guess. Um, but the disabled part is uh, quite new for me. That's even newer because I had like an accident when, uh, about three and a half years ago. And it's still, I think I'm mostly over the trauma of that, but it was like, it was quite a big deal for me to like admit two things in, in a tweet. And I'm now like, should I, should I do this? And I thought like, well, it's, you know, it's a good, it's it's a good thing to see more of this. This is what I'm, this is what helped me realize who I was. And I wanted like, hopefully people to realize like, you know, the person who makes these games is disabled and it doesn't really change much about, you know, the game or my work or anything like that. But um, it is part of who I am. And yeah, I, I think I, I just wanted to, to share that. And I was also very, it was, it was just very nice to see people in that similar situation and see all the other things that they're making and it's it was just really inspiring and yeah i wanted to be part of it well i am so so glad that you <laughs> did i am so thrilled that you did cuz we we were already set to play the game so we would have played the game anyway and we would have still loved it cuz it's a beautiful story but being able to connect to you lucy as the person who created it and and to know just a little bit more about your story that is also so important because so so often we talk about asexual representation in the media and we talk about the Todd Chavez's and and these fictional portrayals of asexuality and that is very very important but real life representation is also mm. vital e- even just even women in certain fields, you you didn't think women did programming things. And I think a lot of us in, in this age bracket grew up also like, well, I haven't ever seen it. So just the representation of women, queer people, non-binary people, and that disability element too, because as disabled people with the entire spectrum of what disabilities can entail, there are so many additional barriers to education, to employment. And so it it really, really helps to see real life people doing cool things. So yeah. I'm I I consider that uh disabled ace day to be a success because I I was able to meet you and and so many other just really, really cool disabled ace creators and business owners because yeah. we we need that real life representation and we we need that community too and I can 
definitely appreciate when you say that you don't really feel like part of the community yet, because I I felt that for like 10 years. (laughs) (laughs) It takes time. You don't necessarily just get to know everyone and, and feel on a personal level with everyone just because you came out as an identity. It still takes some time to to meet the individual people within mm. the queer community that you can really relate to and, you know, play games with and have conversations with and, and relate to on other levels than just the sexuality component to it. So I think, yeah. I think that's so cool. Yeah. I believe you mentioned to us and Maybe, maybe there's not much you can say about it yet, but I, I believe you said you had an unfinished game sort of about mm. coming out as asexual. Do you have any sort of future hopes or goals or um, anything like that that you want to share? Yeah, so this was a game that I was working on kind of immediately after One Night Stand, and its kind of project name was Memories, and it was like a semi-autobiographical game, and it was mostly... I was mostly inspired by the movie Boyhood. I don't know if you've seen that. I haven't, actually. It's it's quite a long film, but it's basically like 10 years of a boy's life from, I think, age 10 to 20. So you see like his teen years, but it was actually shot like in 10 years. So you see the actual actors grow up. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I love that, but I I want that with a, a girl. And I want to see a girl grow up. Mm -hmm. But then, like, as I was writing it, I'm like, you know, I'm discovering myself. Like, I think before then, that was, that was like five years ago. Mm -hmm. I didn't know about asexuality. I didn't really know much about non-binary or agender. I I, I knew a little. I was like, I think that's what I am. But I also don't mind being called a woman. So I'm like, is that what I am? Like, I, I, I don't know. Um, and I'm like, I think I've got a lot of soul searching to do and I'm making this game and it's kind of like, I was writing it and I'm like, I had to keep changing it and revising it. Like, oh, this is, I've changed now. I figured out what that is. Like mm. it, it was like, it, you know, and the main character was about as confused as I was. And that was, that was kind of in its own way beautiful, but it was also like, if you're a player, you're not going to be getting much out of this. <laughs> like, mm. So I'm like, okay. I shelve it, like, and with the idea of hopefully I will come back to it when I know myself better, um, or maybe I will make it fully autobiographical, and then it can show the confusion along the way. Mm. I am not sure. I've also like I've been playing more visual novels recently, and I think Memories was a game that didn't need many choices. It was more of a linear story, like this is what this girl's going through. And let's just add some like artwork and music and things to go with this. Generally, I think I was adding like too many choices that didn't mean anything, and I just I didn't think the, the experience was very good for the player. So whilst I really do want to finish it and put a game about kind of an agender or asexual experience out there, I do know that I need to understand myself better before I can do that. So yeah, it it wasn't uh, arguably wasn't just about those things. It was also about friendship, um, school, uh, divorce, uh, fitting in, uh, first dates, things like that. So it was very much like a finding yourself kind of story. But yeah, it uh, it was just a bit too ambitious, I think, for the time. So I do understand it's very important for asexual representation, and I think. Video games, as we were discussing earlier, are very immersive and a very good way of really putting yourself in someone else's shoes. Mm -hmm. So I very much want to go back to it at some point. And we will be ever so excited to play (laughs) it when when it arrives someday. Because we we definitely want to see more ace representation, well, everywhere, but also very much in video games, just because that's our, our media of choice more often than not. Are there any sort of elements of just asexuality, the discovering yourself journey that you don't think gets enough representation in media, anything that you would really want to see more of, whether that be in something you create or just in general? Um, I think just in general, like asexuality needs way more representation. Um, I think I see a lot of it in comics. Uh, there seems to be a big kind of 
asexual comic artist. Like, it seems to be what a lot of us do. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. what I originally wanted to do as well, which is very fascinating. But I think it's it would be great to see it in a game. I think um, just I played a game called The House in Fata Morgana, which is a kind of gothic visual novel. Uh, it's quite a popular one. And it's not about like asexuality, but it is about queer, like a queer stories, basically. And if, you, if I describe it like that and you go into it, the first few stories are not about that at all. Mm-hmm. But it's quite a long game, but you spend more time with it. You, it, it sorry, it's so hard to talk about without spoiling it. But it really put me in the shoes of an identity that isn't my own. Mm. And it did it so well. And I was like, wow, this is like the game of the year for me. Like, that is the power of video games. I really, really liked it. So oh, it's sounds like... amazing. Yeah, I, I recommend it. It is it is like 50 hours long to read, but it's Rose, really good. Rose, put it on good. the list. <laughs> put it on the list. <laughs> it, it's already on our list. Uh, oh, is it? Okay. <laughs> I, I came across it after we played The Letter. Oh, that which was, was another a very, long one. It was a very long... Very long one. Horror. I haven't played that one. Visual novel. Mm. We we liked the horror aspect. There were some manifestations of the characters that we could have passed on, like uh, the, the character choices. It was just so long that there was a lot of really, really good to it. But there were also some routes that once you get to the end of it after so many hours... And then you restart because if there are multiple routes, we're the kind of players we want to see all the routes because to us, that's like the full story. You see all the sides of it. There were some parts that got very repetitive and weren't very skippable. So Mm. (laughs) there were days where it's like, all right, we're just going to click, 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 click. To speak to some of the mechanics of the game, they did have a skip feature, but sometimes there would be very, very minor changes in dialogue that basically amounted basically amounted to to very little difference yeah and the game wasn't written to be intelligent enough to skip through the parts that were the same makes sense but one thing we did like though they visualized the entire branching nature of the game in a way that you could actually look at and see what scenes you had missed and uh yeah what you hadn't and tried to figure out what you would need to do differently to get through this one branch that you hadn't accessed at that point that's yeah i the game that you just mentioned was one that I found on lists of comparable games or similar genre games that seemed to be very well received. Yeah. Um, I It was on my list for a good few years as well. I was always like, oh, it's really long. Like, when am I going to have time for this? And it was la- I think it was last summer I played it. And I did struggle with it at first because it's made up of like lots of short stories. And then the second one is really quite a horror story, and I don't, I don't do horror. Like I really freak out. If it's visual novels, I can kind of hack it, but I don't usually choose to play them. Mm-hmm. And it got really quite gruesome at some point. I was like, I don't think I can get through this, but I eventually did. I eventually persevered. And then when all the stories start coming together, it's like, oh my god, this is like, it's incredible, and like. The kind of soundtrack is sung in various kind of European languages. I think there's quite a few Portuguese songs. And it's interesting because it's made by like Japanese developers. Mm. So it all feels like some kind of stage play. And yeah, the kind of queer representation, I didn't go into it knowing that that was in there, but it was. And I was just blown away by it. I, it made me feel so compassionate and empathetic and i was like this is what like games and visual novels are all about so i you know i I, i'd love to do something like that but for asexuality so yeah like maybe at some point i'm so excited to play that now (laughs) hope i haven't hyped it up too much (laughs) no we we that's exactly the kind of game that we love and it it almost makes it better that you didn't play it just for the representation because for as as often as we're like we need more ace rep we also want really good ace rep i don't want an ace character just for the sake of it being an ace character i want that character to have a really compelling story or to be a really important part of a very compelling story because 
I also want to just like really enjoy the media I'm partaking in. And I, I think one of the coolest things for us about BoJack Horseman again was that we already liked that show and we're watching it as the seasons came yeah. out before Todd even came out as asexual. So that was just like the cherry on top because we already love the story and this just makes it so much better and so much richer. So that's that's very cool. We'll yeah. we'll have to apparently it's already on the list. So <laughs> we'll we'll get to it at some point. But um that that was actually something to uh mention one night stand again, something we really, really oh. appreciated because we played it in, in near enough proximity to the letter that that was such a long one. And one night stand is much shorter, but we really liked that after you finish a game of one night stand, you had the screen with the different endings. So you knew sort of how many endings there were and you kind of got a, a clue to how you could get some of the endings. Yeah. We, we really appreciated that because we, when we play really, really long drawn out visual novels, we almost have to cheat and go online and be like, what decisions do we have to make to ensure that we get a different ending so that we don't spend hours and hours and hours going through this just to make one mistake and get the same ending we already did. So yeah. it, it, it was really cool that we didn't have to sort of look up and cheat on one night stand because it's like, oh, look, we have, we have a little clue. I bet if we do this differently, uh, yeah. we'll get a different result. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah, I there's one thing that I don't like players having to do is leave the game and go look up a guide online mm. or or worse go through like a let's play video and try and find the bit that and mm. cuz I have, I've done that so much and it it breaks you out of it and it's like why not just give people a clue of what they need to to do like and my next game has a similar thing where there's like a little tip button so if you're ever a little bit mm. stuck, it's like you can just check. Instead of having to like go load up a web page, it's like it's just there. Like you can, it's you can so just, nice. It, you it's... don't have to use it, but if you want to use it, it's there. <laughs> yeah, that's that's also good because sometimes when you're having to go into walkthrough mode, you can't get all of the tips that you need to mm. get to the conclusion that you wanted without also spoiling some of the experience. Mm. Yeah, like like. It, it's very difficult sometimes to comb through the information and not have a few things get given away prematurely, and then you don't experience it in the same way. Yeah, that's that's the thing. Like you want to be able to control like how the player is going to get that tip. Like as you say, Royce, um, it's really disappointing when you're just trying to find a tip and it's like, oh, I've gone to one chapter too far, and now I know where this story's going. And that's happened to me on a game that I'm playing at the moment, and it was kind of frustrating. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we 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 really really liked that. We thought it was very clever, and it was it was just perfect for the for the game that it was, and the size and the length. And was were there was is, I want to say nine? Were there nine different endings? Uh, it was twelve. Twelve. Okay, I don't know. I had nine. I guess it was almost a year ago now. Goodness, what month is it? Yeah. Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> what is time anymore? But. Yeah, we we thought that was very very cool. So the House of Fata Morgana is on our list. Are there any other games that you really appreciate that have either good ace rep or just more broadly general queer rep? Mm, yeah. So the game that I'm playing at the moment is uh, AI: The Somnium Files, and I the thing is when I I'm playing like this, this is like the first game and the second game. I'm playing the second one at the moment. And when I thought these games, I'm like, yeah, that's really great. LGBTQ plus kind of representation. There's a character called Mizuki who's like a young girl in the first game. And she's pretty much just like really angry at people for not like treating these people well, like minorities. She's like, oh, I, I'm sick of this really oppressive world. And she's great. And it's like, oh, I love her. And she's really like angry about it as well, which is great. Mm -hmm. And she does it about uh, disabilities and race and religion as well. She's like, I wish we could just treat everyone with respect. And mm -hmm. I'm like, that's great. But then at the same time, when I I was just preparing for this podcast, I just read, you know, I read the synopsis of the original game again, the first one. And I find out like, sorry if this is a bit of a spoiler, but the, the one of the killers in the game is um, told that he has a brain dysfunction. 
that means he can't feel love or oh. or oxytocin or, or whatever. And I'm just there like, oh. is this arrow hate? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> oh man, that that is a shame. That is a shame. Because yeah, there's there's the aromantic element of it, but then there's there's also a disability element of it. Because mm, there yeah. are you know people with various neurodiversities that can affect empathy levels, but that does not mean that they are abusive or yeah. serial killers. Yeah. Oh wow, that's yeah. So I was there, like, oh, this is the game I'm playing right now, and I really like this series. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> I mean, you can still like something and be like, that wasn't the best choice. <laughs> I wish they made a different choice there. Yeah. Goodness knows we've watched plenty of things where it's like, we're still enjoying the story, but maybe they could have had a, a sensitivity reader. Maybe their team of writers could have been a little more diverse. <laughs> so, yeah, I oh, think it's a work in process. Yeah. With this game, I... I think the heart is in the right place. They just didn't... Th this one slipped through kind of mm -hmm. thing. I, I wouldn't want it to put people off playing the game. I do think it's generally very good. But I, I think they just wanted to like explain in, in, in a scientific way why this character is the way he is. And it's like, oh, you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's too bad. That's too bad. But I mean, I mean yeah, there. We we kind of went through that when we were... We did an episode where we talked about Dexter because that was a TV show that started good, but also kind of went off the rails. But for, for as much as it's like, oh, we don't want our asexual characters to all be serial killers. <laughs> it's like when, when we were going back to rewatch Dexter and just hearing some of the lines that he said from like episode one, where he's looking at allosexual people and being like, why are you this way? I don't understand. We were like, that's actually really funny. <laughs> and, and we just, <laughs> we enjoyed hearing someone else on a screen say that, even though it's like, yeah, but it's because he's a serial killer. <laughs> there, there's also, you know, you know, there's a general problem of queer identities being cast as villains mm. f for any number of reasons, just because they're different and because the writers don't fully understand that experience. But a lot of cases, the villains in the story are the most interesting character to me. That's yeah. also very true. <laughs> and it's it's also like the the chicken or the egg. It's like, is the villain actually the most compelling character here? Or is it just because I can relate a little more to the villain than the other characters? And it's like, I don't know what the answer is. I don't know if I need to know or if I care all that much. But yeah, I very often the queer villain is my favorite. So. <laughs> this is so true. Like recently, like as I've been getting older, it's like, I relate with these villains so much. <laughs> yes. I'm like, is something wrong with me? <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> no, that's, that's a pretty, pretty common experience. I think at least, <laughs> at least in amongst the company that we keep, <laughs> maybe we're all just villains. <laughs> so do you know of any games with Ace or Arrow Rep, there aren't a lot that we're no, aware of, but I have, there are a couple. I have some more, like the I have the Trans Rep games, a couple of suggestions there. If, Ooh. So wow, let's hear them. The first one is Tell Me Why, which <gasps> is the Life is Strange team. We love like, it. Yeah. We love that game. <laughs> it's, it's really nice. I actually preferred it to Life is Strange Tr True Colors, the latest one. Mm hmm. I really liked the characters like Tyler and Allison, the siblings. Oh, that was such a good game. We've, yeah. we've played all of the games from... Have we played all of them from that studio at this point, even the ones that aren't in that genre? I think so. We played... What What was it? Twin Mirror? Fairly yes. recently. Oh, I that, that was, I that was the last one that. on our list. Ah. That one was interesting. So we played the first Life is Strange years ago and it was beautiful. We loved it. It was unlike any game we've played before. And the good and the bad of that is that we know we're going to enjoy Life is Strange 2 and Life is Strange 3 and Tell Me Why is could be a Life yeah. is Strange. It just I think it only wasn't because of licensing issues if I remember right. Like a different studio owned that IP now. 
something like that. Like it it could have been the mechanics were similar. The art style was similar, but so I know I'm going to enjoy them. I think they're well-written. I like the gameplay, but at the same time, I'm not necessarily going to have exactly the same experience I did like the very first time Mm. where this was a completely new from anything else I've ever played before. But I, I do think tell me why was probably probably up there. I haven't thought about categorizing them in terms of favorites, but oh, that was very good trans rep. I think then it, it was voiced by a trans voice actor. I think they won yeah. all kinds of awards uh, for it. It was, it was a beautiful game. Yeah. The other game is a very small indie game called A Year of Springs. And that is uh, like a trilogy game of like visual novel, like short stories. Mm. And I've only played the first story of the trilogy, but it's basically about a trans woman who wants to go on a hot springs trip with her friends. And it's how, like, oh, well, you know, half of the game is, like, just her friends trying to make an appointment. Like, oh, well, you Mm -hmm. upset my friend. And it's like, no, like, these Mm. are gendered rooms and you, you, you you don't fit kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But I actually learned from this game that, and I didn't know this, that um, like trans people, if they want to change gender officially, they have to be sterilized in Japan. Ooh. And I did not know that. And this game like has a very, very cute art style, very sweet music. It's very gentle, but it informs you about this. And I just thought that was really, really like worth noting. And it's quite a small, short game, so... I think it's on itch.io if you want to experience that as well. I recommend it. Rice put it on the list. <laughs> Rice is keeper of the media list in our, <laughs> our ever growing media list. Uh, that that sounds great. And that that is um very good to have something you can learn about from mm. different different countries and different cultures too, because I think a lot of the online sort of queer discourse is very western centric very american centric and of course we have our issues we have our own political issues to be sure but things can just vary so much country to country and we can sort of very easy to miss if you aren't Mm -hmm. intentionally trying to go out of your way to keep a more international view of the news and the queer community and variety of experiences. Year of Springs. Oh, that sounds very good. Now I'm getting all excited about all the great <laughs> games. Uh, surprise, we wanted to trick you into coming onto the podcast just so we could <laughs> get good <laughs> recommendations for video games. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, this this is uh, really cool. Oh, um, in kind of researching for this episode... I did find there is an asexual character in The Outer Worlds. Now, I haven't played this game, but Mm. apparently, I think they're called Parvati. So they are like out as ace. So I'm... I was never interested in that game, but now I'm like, hmm, (laughs) might need to research that a little bit. Well, let let me tell you, we actually... We played The Outer Worlds for exactly that reason. Okay. We... Uh, recently did in an episode recorded talking about the game. And I would say for you, it kind of depends on what kind of games you enjoy playing because we really enjoyed the character. We thought the character was very well done. We thought the options were very well done and we loved just the story about it. The uh, writer who sort of took control of this character is also ace herself. So she was able to bring some of that real first person experience to it. And I think that showed in many ways. And when we played it, we basically played through her storyline. And then we were like, "Eh, I've kind of had enough of this game. (laughs) Just just because the genre isn't our favorite Mm. genre of game. We liked her storyline, but we didn't necessarily feel compelled to see the entire game all the way through after we finished her arc. Right. You mentioned liking Mass Effect. Yes. So this this might be more up your alley. Okay. Both of us actually don't really play shooters at all. And after however many hours into this game, the 
shooting mechanics and whatnot, the the combat mechanics, the world exploration got a bit tired. Mm. And we weren't really invested in the story outside the characters. Right. So we basically completed what we came here for, which was mainly Parvati's storyline and also some of the other NPCs who, in our opinion, were less interesting. Right. Overall internet consensus is that Parvati is the best character in the game. <laughs> she is unanimously everyone's favorite, <laughs> which is quite remarkable. That's really cool. For an ace character. But we did drop off after getting through that aspect of the storyline, which was pretty well through the game. It was pretty far into it. Okay. It sounds like I'll just watch it on YouTube at some point. <laughs> I just don't have the time at the moment. <laughs> It is a bit of a long one. We we also <laughs> we we started playing the Outer Worlds because we had heard such great things about Parvati and we were looking for a new game anyway and so we started it and we played it a bit. But then Elden Ring came out. Mm. So that became our lives until we finished it. <laughs> so <laughs> we we kind of had to take a break from Outer Worlds for a while to play Elden Ring and then we came back. So <laughs> We, we did finish Parvati's storyline eventually, but yeah, o- overall, I, I was pleased with the representation, though. So I, I think whether you decide to watch it or play it, I think, especially as someone who writes things with branching options, I mm-hmm. think you'll, you'd be very interested in the options that they gave and presented to the player and the mm-hmm. ones that they didn't, because the uh, writer was very clear to say, like, I didn't want any, like bigoted options i didn't (laughs) want the player to be able to say anything cruel Hmm. but there is still the spectrum of how you respond in certain ways so yeah cool did you have any others or are shall shall we go on to talking about your upcoming game because we're very excited to hear more about that too yeah i only have like a couple of other games but they're all the big ones like mass effect stardew valley gone home you know other like games where you can be like bisexual or they're they're games I like but they Mm -hmm. have been around a while now so yeah uh, we can go on to video first (laughs) why does gone home sound familiar rice did we play that one or is that just one we're planning on playing soon (laughs) checking (laughs) checking the giant list (laughs) a list I think gone home came out in 2013 I think could be wrong hmm I believe that that is one that we have had on our list for a long time, but haven't actually played. The reason I had to stop and look was because a few months ago, we did play a game that was sort of a house exploration, like family personal story sort of game. Oh. And I couldn't remember what game that was. That was uh, Edith Finch, right? Oh. What remains That's of Edith it. Finch? That also had um, a queer storyline element one of the characters in that Mm. that one was tragic (laughs) yeah i do really like that game game, though (laughs) (laughs) yeah uh gone home is um another you know house exploration um but when i first played it my husband was like oh you gotta play this game and he kind of like put me in a room to play it and switched all the lights off and tried to create a horror experience and i'm there really on edge and he's really trying to make it seem like this this thing that it's not. And then at the end, I was like, why did you do that? Like, it's it's just, it's actually a really nice story. <laughs> but yeah, I, I can't, if you haven't played it, I can't really uh, say too much about it without spoiling it. So, but it is quite short. All right, well, we'll bump it up on the list then. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. I, I I am dying to hear for as as much as you are able to discuss, since it is a forthcoming game, you have started releasing some- uh, teaser trailers for an upcoming game called Videoverse. Yep. Tell tell us what you can about it. We're so excited. <laughs> uh, well, Videoverse is a, another visual novel game. It is a game that's mostly about love and friendship, and it's inspired by Nintendo's Miiverse that used to be a uh, a popular thing a few years ago. And it's about like kind of making friends online and being like a teenager again. So you play as Emmett, who is this young boy, and he is very much into his video games. And he, he's also like an aspiring artist. So he's like kind of trying to like draw on his tablet 
and do these little like meverse like drawings and share them with people. But then you find out like, oh, he's had like some like online trolls like kind of putting his artwork down and he's lost confidence in himself. So he's kind of like he talks to his friends and his friends are like, Oh come on, you know, like they encourage him. They they show him like, Oh, you should share your stuff. So he does, and he meets another artist who then he befriends. And then they those two get to know each other more and yeah, I, I don't wanna spoil it too much. But there are like loads of kind of side stories in this one. You don't have to do them; uh, they're very optional. But you can like fully explore kind of this fake social media gaming network that I've made. It's very kind of reminiscent of like MSN message boards, Meverse, mm. of course. Like a kind of a kind of early noughties, early internet mm-hmm. kind of thing. The music has been composed by Clark Abowd, who did music for uh, Slay the Spire and Kind Words, and he's done a really cool kind well, of... Kind Words! Yeah, yeah. We know that one. I love Kind Words. <laughs> it's very sweet. It is very sweet. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I want to do that, but like a narrative game, so you, you're very much encouraging the game to send nice messages to people. Aww. But of course, you, it can take a slight turn for the worse. It does. It is a visual novel with choices. Mm-hmm. But if you don't help the community grow, it just gets more kind of nasty. It gets more like how the internet is now. Mm. And I think there's a part of me that's like does really miss what message boards and fan forums and things used to feel like. It's mm-hmm. like oh, people know each other. People care about each other. People like used to chat in their spare time, or, or maybe it's just what kids did. But it's like. I just miss those times. I I think I'm 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 a little bit like maybe sad about how the internet is kind of becoming. It's just a very angry place where people yell at each other and nothing mm. really gets achieved. And I just wanted to kind of bring some compassion back into that. And uh, yeah, Kind Words was definitely an inspiration. So I was like, oh, I love the music of this game. So I uh, I stuck out the uh, the composer and. Uh, Luckily, he uh, wanted to to help. So that's really that cool. is so cool. Because <laughs> yeah, I I really enjoy kind words. I think it's such a such a breath of fresh air amongst all of the internet of it yeah. all. I mean, you you said it perfectly. It very often feels like you log on and it's just people yelling at each other. And so yeah, I think that's such an interesting way to explore narratively the. Um, older sort of smaller more community focused branches of the internet rather than the you know the uh, screaming into the void on Mm -hmm. on twitter as they say (laughs) so that sounds very very cool Mm -hmm. i also just like i've always really enjoyed games where there are a lot of a lot of different characters that you can explore different aspects of the characters and i don't think i've seen one that is like a message board. Normally okay. we have ones that are like, like you're a barista or you're a bartender yeah, and you have all of the clients and some that are repeats who come in and the more you engage with them, you start to learn more and get more connected to people. We've, we've played games with that sort of setup. Oh, so that's, that's very exciting. And and we will be the ones who uh, do all of the different side stories because that, <laughs> that, is, that is how we play games like this. We want the whole story. <laughs> That's awesome. I should also mention that the um, I actually added a feature having thinking about the lack of asexual representation. My original idea for this game was like a meverse love story. It's like I want it mm-hmm. to be a love story. I'm really romantic. I really love this kind of thing. It's like that's what I want to do. I've always wanted to do it. One Night Stand wasn't really a love story. Mm-hmm. I want I want to make something real sweet. And then you know, once, you know, listening to your podcasts, hearing, learning more about like Arrow people as well, and realizing like there's not really like much representation for them. And I'm forcing people into like, oh, you've got to fall in love in this game. And it's like, it's not, it's not just a linear story. Like this is the player is involved and they should be able to interact how they want to. So I actually added like a platonic kind of arrow ace kind of route if you will so the player can if they just want to be friends they can just be friends 
and that they, is can, so they cool. can just be a supportive friend if they want to be. Yeah. <laughs> that is so exciting to hear. And I'm sure many of our listeners and many in the community are also going to be really excited about that. We watched a an Ace and Arrow gaming panel a while back where there were some game developers and some just gamers or streamers who were all a spec and one of the streamers oh it's gonna drive me nuts i can't think of his name off the top of my head i want to say kiki it's they're actually a drag queen (laughs) and i think kiki is the drag name we'll we'll link all links to things we talk about in the show notes as usual but yeah they they were saying that playing games even like stardew valley or or things as a streamer that the first thing someone will come on and ask is like who are you romancing <laughs> and and they're like i i am a romantic and i'm playing these games that i don't have to romance people yeah, and and yeah. yet everyone coming to watch me is that's the first thing they ask and i thought that was a really interesting component cuz mm. i i'm not an a romantic streamer but it, it makes sense just sort of society's obsession with romantic and or slash sexual things and plus options are are just cool and and we'll we'll play all the options we'll 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 do the romance route we'll do the play <laughs> we we like doing that i think for me it's been very important to make sure that the platonic route is just as satisfying as the romantic route mm, and that's very important it's it's reached that point where i'm like okay i prefer the platonic route <laughs> <laughs> wow yeah it's like it feels less selfish somehow it's like less about what the player wants and more about you caring about that person so mm. yeah i'm i'm pretty happy with how it's turned out oh that is that's very cool that is <laughs> so cool to hear i love everything about that do we know when when we can expect this uh unfortunately uh, videoverse hasn't got a release date right now but uh, I am hoping it will be like probably early next year. But it is, it's one of those that will be kind of done mm-hmm. when it's done. But yeah, I'm working very hard on it. So <laughs> hopefully soon because it is very tiring. <laughs> oh, I, I bet. It sounds like there's so much that goes into making a game, which I mean, we, we just admire all the work you put in. This is very, very cool. But where can the people find and follow you so that when you do have a release date, they'll be able to know right away? Yeah. So on Twitter and Instagram, Facebook and TikTok, I am at Games by Kinmoku. That's K-I-N-M-O-K-U. And then on Steam or Itch.io, I'm just Kinmoku. So Videoverse is now live on Steam, so you can wishlist it already. Or if you haven't played One Night Stand, you can download that straight away and play that. Excellent. Is there anything else you want to talk about or touch on that we haven't done so already? I guess just thank you. So, thank you so much for having me. And I always wanted to chat to you too, because I listen to your podcast a lot and you just sound like two of like my old friends that live in the UK, so I don't get to see them that much. And it's like, oh, you guys sound so cool. I'd love to chat. But also like to just thank you for making this podcast and spreading awareness and everything. It's really good. It's it's really a pleasure. And and we're glad that we get to do this and that others are are getting benefit from it. Because yeah, we know that there needs to be real life representation, just like fictional representations. Like there just aren't that many married ace couples that are publicly out and and spreading awareness so mm. we're, we're happy to fill that role if we can do it justice <laughs> oh i did remember one thing but i remember you guys mentioned that you really hated um the, the ace representation in sex education yes. and i was like like screaming like yes like i'm <laughs> sick of everyone saying like it's just it's so great Good. i'm like it's rubbish Good. it's like five minutes of nothing <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so glad to hear that. We we did have a couple of people after that episode say like, yes, finally someone said it. <laughs> Which, and I mean, that was that was kind of another reason why we wanted to start a podcast was because we've both been, I mean, obviously we knew each other, were asexual before getting married. We've been together over eight years now. And 
a lot of the popular talking points that we see online just isn't really our experience. And we're like, where is this coming from? And why does everyone love this thing that we don't love? Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, may, are there other people who also feel the same way we do? And they're just not vocal about it like everyone else is. And <laughs> I think I did tweet about it at the time. Like, I don't know. I had a few gripes with like some of sex education. There was something else that I didn't like about it. I can't remember what it was now. But I remember tweeting like kind of angrily, like, this is rubbish. This sucks. Like, <laughs> I'm there like, why am I watching this show? Like, I don't know. I guess because like it does, it does help educate some people. Like, um, you know, me growing up, I didn't really have that much like sex education at all. We were taught it at school, but it was very much like, you know, how to reproduce. That was it. Mm hmm. And learning about other sexualities, it's like, okay, I can see why this show is popular, but boy, do they, like, really just brush aside asexuality. It's like, in, in one moment, they're like, oh yeah, it's fine that you're asexual, don't worry about it. And then in the next episode, they're all, like, singing about, like, sex and dancing around, <laughs> and it's like, where's that asexual girl gone? Is she, I, I wouldn't she's blame gone. her if she's just gone. <laughs> it's like, this is a bit much. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, yes, I, ab absolutely. And and that's why we say, like, we don't just want an ace character to be there for the sake of an ace character be there. <laughs> like, we want them to be a vital part of the story. Because that's what gets people connected on an emotional, personal level and what begins to foster empathy and understanding and can lead to proper allyship in the long run and uh, proper education, not because you're throwing the information in someone's face as a PSA, but because they want to learn and understand more because they start to care. So yeah, that sex education. <laughs> we, we have thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> We are also like, I think that was, was that our second episode, Royce? I think it might've just been our second episode and we're like, well, time, time to test the waters here. This is a hot <laughs> take, but we're coming out the gates with it. Yeah, that was, that was episode two. That was all the way back in October. <laughs> wow. It's like, if you guys agree, then maybe this podcast isn't for you. <laughs> <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> Nice. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. So, yeah, we're we're so thrilled to talk to you, and we're gonna be very excited to uh, play your game. We'll be we'll be tweeting out about it, I am sure. And also, I I suppose I don't think we've even mentioned this on the podcast yet, which is kind of weird. Maybe we should have done that. But we we started a marketplace for Ace and Arrow owned oh. businesses. That is on our website. And I, I believe you put a one night stand up there. I did. It's... And I think we have one other Ace created video game on there right now. Mm. I think we have two different video games on there, but we just broke a hundred. We have over a hundred shops on there now, Cool. which is baffling. I didn't even know there were a hundred Ace and Arrow creators selling their, their beautiful wares, but we're, we're thrilled to bring those people together and so yeah we'll we'll make sure to get the the new game up there once that comes out too okay. <laughs> and um yeah so so in the meantime please make sure to do the things like follow subscribe on whatever uh, platform it is you are listening to us on and make sure to go and follow lucy at games by kinmoku and definitely make sure to snatch up One Night Stand if you have not already and be on the lookout for Videoverse. And until then, we will talk to you all next week. Goodbye.